Father, we thank you for the splendor of your love. There's just no way we would have been able to come to you if you hadn't come to us. And we're glad that you did. Making a way for us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to come boldly before your throne where we obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. Father, we thank you because of this very awesome privilege. Father, may we never trivialize that privilege. Father, may we always recognize the glory of your presence and give it the honor that is due submitting and yielding ourselves totally to you in the mighty name of Jesus Father we thank you because you are with us always even till the very end praise the Lord God is good let's be seated everybody God bless you thank you so much well done thank you guys greatly greatly appreciated oh yes I have Emmanuel's name saved on my phone as Emmanuel Sound. And I tell you what, there's always something about having Emmanuel do sound. I don't know, maybe it's because I'm biased when I see him on the sound, I'm just so excited. Or maybe truly he just has the grace for it. Can I have one of those uh, tissues, please? So that I can uh, clean my glasses up a little bit here. Praise God. And you know, one of the things that uh, myself and Pastor Joseph were talking about recently was the fact that David was so in love with the presence of God that he actually had full-time musicians. Remember that when David became king, before David became king, when Saul was king, David was a part-time musician. He was a part-time psalmist. So every now and again, he will come to the, to the courts of the king and they were usually, according to scripture, when the king was in trouble, when he was having his, you know, bouts of depression and anxiety, because, you know, um, Saul, toward the end of his ministry, had a lot of mental illness, you know, because when you try to do God's work without using God's help, it becomes too much for you as a human being to bear. Even though the man, Saul, was from a very wealthy family. He was the tallest man in the entire nation of Israel. The Bible says from the shoulder up, he was taller than everybody else. Why is that important for us to know? He was born into affluence. And that was very significant for us to know that even when his father sent him on an errand, they had to send a grown man to follow him. You know, back in the day, before you can assign somebody to be following your son, you must have a lot of resources. But then he started to lean more on his own ability than the ability of God. And so when he ran into trouble, he was sent for David. But by the time David became king, David did not want to take chances with the presence of God. He knew that once he had the presence of God, everything that he needed was there. So he had full-time musicians. My wife and I, one of the things that we desire the most is to get to a place wherein Communion House will have worship 24-7. Praise the Lord. So that you can always come into the building and then you have musicians playing. To be honest, what these guys are doing, in my opinion, is more important than what some people go to do 9 to 5. Praise the Lord. 9 to 5. For about three years in this country, and in Canada, I was working across these two continents. I was an auditor. I was a management consultant, but my area of specialization was in audits. I would audit systems, audit standards and frameworks. And when I ask people what they do, I'm like, wait a minute. This is what they pay you the big box for? In fact, some people were so ashamed to tell what they did that they will pretend to be absent whenever I was on site. And sometimes I would send them an email ahead of time saying, wait a minute, this is what I'm seeing here as, the, as your standard or your standard operating procedure. Could you send me the others? And they'd be like, no, that's it. No, 
I want documents that describe what you do. And they're like, that's it. And some of these guys are paid $200,000, $100,000. They get paid a lot of money. It's so ridiculous. They have all the conveniences. They go on holidays and the company pays for. And I'm like, and the church cannot afford to have musicians who are hallowing the name of God and distilling the presence of God 24-7. Something is wrong somewhere, but it's okay because it's about to be made right. Praise the Lord. The, the word of the Lord came to his prophet saying, God from his holy habitation has seen the abomination that is committed on the earth by the sons of men, wherein the servant is on the horse and the owner is walking. I have seen the abomination, says the Lord, that is being perpetrated upon the earth, wherein the maiden takes the husband of her mistress. The Lord is saying, I am setting it right the way that it should be. We should have the resources to be able to create the things that are important. Earlier uh, this week, um, I, I had an opportunity to listen on, a, on an interview, um, maybe some of you even saw it, of one of these very popular women's magazines dating back to the 90s. You could even say what's the most popular of them. I'm not going to mention their name and give them cheap publicity, especially if you used to read the, the magazine and now you've repented. I don't want to remind you. But in any case, they were talking about the fact that they hired people just to create a condition for women to think like men. They hired people. So imagine when we, who have the divine privilege by God, to hire people to create an atmosphere of God's presence so that we can think as priests and we fail at doing so. But David did not. David made sure. David was so particular about worship, about creating the atmosphere of God's presence and participating in it. It's a different thing for you to say, oh, people should go and praise God and you are watching TV or you are just being entertained otherwise. No, he was involved to the point that one day he said, look, these boys are no longer playing like we used to play. And then he told their music director, he told him and he asked him, he said, have you not shown these guys how to play this from the book of Yasha? It's one of those times that the book of Yasha was clearly recommended in scripture. He says, you need to send them back to the book of Yasha so that they can see how to operate the instrument so that the prophetic is unin uninterrupted, uninhibited. You see what I mean? Because we all know that the prophetic rides well on the wings of the minstrel. The minstrel ministry and the prophetic ministry go hand in hand. And so I'm just so excited because I don't take these things for granted. And I just want to say once again that y'all are very much appreciated here. We thank God for the sacrifice that you make being here. God bless you all. Praise the Lord. So here is the deal. I want to talk about a couple of things today. But one of the things that is very paramount on my heart is... As we are stepping into this season, there should not be any one of us who is guessing where they are with God. It's very important. You see, because you can't be guessing where you're at with God. Does he love you? Does he not love you? Is he going to make a way for you? Is he not going to make a way for you? No, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 11 that they that know their God shall be strong and they will do exploits. The ones who know their God. So if you do not know God or you are not confident of who you are in him, it will be very difficult for you to be able to operate in the times that we are in. And why? The answer is very simple. The resources that you are meant to expend in making progress with, with God will be spent questioning your own status. Many of us wake up and all through the day we are questioning who we are in God. We are questioning our status. With where I'm at, is God going to use me? With all of what I hear at church and in prophecy, am I a part of what God is doing? No, God is not looking for people who do not know who they are in Him. You see, to know your God begins with knowing who you are in Him. Because you are a good reference point for the dealings of God in your life. He 
If I say that I know God as the provider, but from my standpoint, I don't have the things that I need. Do I really know God? Or I only have heard about him? If I know that the faithfulness of God is everlasting, and yet, in my own situation, I sometimes feel like an orphan. I feel like God has forgotten me. Do I really know God? Do you know that from time to time, we sometimes feel like God is God from a very highly divine standpoint, but as far as your existence is concerned, his divinity is not as apparent. Let me tell you something. Your God and your Father is not a God that is afar off. The Bible says it is in him that we live and move and have our being. The Bible says that we are seated in Christ Jesus at the right hand of the Father. When someone is sitting at your right hand, at least you would know something about them. And what you don't know, you can ask them. You can ask Anita right now what she ate for lunch. She doesn't have to tell us, but she can tell you. You understand what I mean? And that is exactly what God has done for us. He has positioned us so close to himself that we are not supposed to be without the knowledge of God. We are supposed to know God. And I'm going to read to us a verse of scripture. Let's turn our Bibles quickly to the book of Psalms chapter 83, verse 3. And then we're going to pray. The book of Psalms, chapter 83, verse 3. Let me tell you something, a secret. If you don't know already, the book of Psalms is one of those books in the Bible that is structured in such a way that the, the verses and the rhythm of the verses can reconstruct the atmosphere around you. It can reset the atmosphere around you. I've tried several things. I have tried playing several scriptures, but I have yet to find one that does condition my atmosphere as quickly as the book of Psalms. You don't have to take my word for it. Go home, find the, the book of Psalms. I prefer the New King James Bible or the King James Bible. Find on YouTube, it is free, right? And there is one that has no background music. Because you know some of them, they have all kinds of background music, wherein what is really getting to you is the music as opposed to the words. Sometimes that is okay, there's a place for that as well. But for me, I have found that that particular concept of the book of Psalms without any music, because itself is music. You understand what I mean? When you read Psalms, almost every chapter that you look into is music. See, I say almost because some of them, you can literally say that they're poems or they're songs, but a lot of them are literally music described using words. If you get it, you get it. And so here is the deal. The Bible lets us know that all things were made by the word of God and there was nothing made that was made without the word. Let me quickly share with you an insight. The Bible says love believes all things, right? But we tend to think that maybe that statement should not just be said so generically because if love believes all things, are we saying that we are then to become gullible people who believe everything? No, but is the word of God true? Alan, Romans chapter three verse four. Let God be true and every man a liar. And so if the Bible says that love, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, believes all things, that means I'm supposed to believe everything. Yes or no? Yes. The Bible says love believes all things. That's what the word of God says. And we don't question what the word of God says. What do we do? We understand it. You understand what I mean? And so when the Bible says love believes all things, 
then God expects you to believe all things. The reason why many of us find it difficult to believe the word of God is because of the fact that we are still operating or living using Adam's operating system. When Adam ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he received a kind of parity within him that is always making moves based on such decisions. Am I to believe this or not? Is this good or is this evil? Is this good or is this evil? We keep going back and forth. But the Bible says whether you turn to the left or to the right, you will hear a voice telling you this is the way. Walk in it. I'm supposed to be led by the Spirit, not by any form of probability. The Bible says with men, things are probable, but, the, but with God, all things are possible. So when I toss a coin with man, it is either going to be heads or tails. What do we call that in math? We'll call that probability. And it's 50-50. But the Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 16 that though the lot is cast into the laps, it's every decision is of the Lord. Which Jesus said in another way. He said with man, it might not be. He said, but with God, all things are possible. So with God, it is always a possibility. Every time you toss a coin, the outcome is always that which the Lord already determines. So with God, it's not a probability. With God, it is always a possibility. And so I'm not supposed to live my life based on probability. Do I invest here or not? What is Kirk doing? Oh, what is Alex doing? No, I'm supposed to be led by the Spirit. And when the Spirit is leading you, it may appear random, but nothing is more informed. When I say appear random, Jesus gave us an example. He says, the wind blows where it listeth. So is anyone that is led by the Spirit. The word listeth means there is an order in the mind of the Spirit. Even though to you it looks like a wind, but to the Spirit there is an order. So if that is the way God expects me to live, then when the Bible says love believes all things, I need to believe all things so that I am not caught questioning or doubting what God has said. I know half of you don't agree with me just yet, but I'm gonna help you out a little bit. A lie is not a thing. When the Bible says love believes all things, it doesn't include a lie. You understand what I mean? When the Bible says love believes all things, what are the all things that God is talking about? John chapter 1, verse 3. He says by him, which is the word of God. Remember, verse 1 says in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 3 says, by him all things were made. And there was nothing made that was made without the word. So when the Bible says love believes all things, that means everything that the word of God makes, love believes it. You understand what I mean? But there is rumor on television. There is a lie in the, there are lies in the marketplace. So how do I then determine what to believe or what not to believe? It is very simple. The Bible says that there was nothing made that was made. Let me break that down to you a little bit. It's a little play on words. But you all know how God operates. The Bible says that all things were made by the word of God. But there was nothing made. Nothing was made. <laughs> nothing was made. Why do we call God Father? Because he's the father of creation. He was the one that conceived of creation and he birthed creation. That is why from his perspective on some days, creation is still inside of him. Because you know God is the same yesterday, today and forever. God is not trapped in time. So on some days, even though creation has already been birthed, the Bible says that in him all things consist. And that is how God is able to have mercy on us. Because the mercy of God resides in the womb of God. That is the reason why the origin of the word mercy is the same word womb. Okay? So if God 
the father of creation, is called the father because he made all things, then it does make sense that nothing also was made, but it was not made by God. Nothing was made, but it was not made by God. The Bible says concerning Satan that in him iniquity was found. He conceived of nothing. And that is the reason why Jesus calls him the father of lies. So lies constitute nothing. The truth is everything. If you get the way to recalibrate your mind to understand what I have just said, your faith will be in cruise control. What that means is whenever you hear the word of God, you immediately believe it because your heart is set to believe all things. And if somebody spoke a lie, you will not believe it because a lie is nothing. Let me explain it slowly. You see, because this thing has helped me a great deal. The way it helps you, the way it helps us is this. If Shayla is casting a vision that God has given to her, to Johnny at work, and Johnny says, you can't do that because that is not true. You can't tell me that I can't do a thing when the word of God says I can do all things. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things. So when Johnny tells Shayla that you cannot do that, that is nothing because it is a lie because it is outside of the premise of the word of God. And because she's already married to the word of, word of God, she's now engaged and not available to believe a lie. Ah, man daboro sotori kelebe sonteli yalama. Let me tell you something. I'm glad that God gave me this example because if we are going to know God, this is the requirement for knowing God. What is the requirement for knowing God? The Bible says, whosoever must come to God must first of all believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So in order for you to know God and to walk with God, you have to be aligned with him in such a way that when nothing comes, it bounces off because your cells are already occupied by the word of God. So when somebody comes to Shayla and says, Shayla, you can't do that, he doesn't even get a chance to settle within her consciousness Talk less of going into her subconscious mind where the forces that govern life exist. The Bible says that the forces that govern life, you see the things that you see in the natural, they're like paper that you print from a computer. Once you print the thing out and it's on paper, Anita, can you use your fingers to change what's already printed? No. But when you go back to the keyboard, while it's still a soft copy, you can change it. The Bible says your subconscious mind is that keyboard that can change the things in the realm of the spirit. The Bible says out of it are the forces that govern life. Whatever it sets, it, it's what comes out. That's what explains the reason why sometimes you are quoting scriptures. Oh, the Lord is my provider. I shall not want, but you are in lack. Because it is only your head that believes that. Your subconscious mind is not yet aware of it because you have spent more time telling it that you will lack and suffer than you have told it that you will be in plenty. So you still need time to recalibrate that computer. You understand what I'm saying? You need time to recalibrate and recondition that computer. But in the meantime, if you or Conversely, rather, if you have instructed yourself that love believes all things and you have defined to your very essence that all things refers to whatever the word of God has made because the Bible says all things were made by him and there was nothing that was made. So you recognize that there are things and there are nothings. Anything that is not in the word of God is nothing. And so, no matter how well the devil describes it, it is still nothing. 
You understand what I mean? It doesn't matter how sweet talking a politician is. The fact that he's telling me that he can take the place of God over my domain is nothing because God says you do not need men to rule over you. He says I am your God and I am your king. So it doesn't matter what they're saying. It's not getting into my spirit because I know that the Lord God Almighty rules over the affairs of men. And that is the reason why they can lie all day long. As far as I'm concerned, it is nothing. Because you see, this love right here is already believing all things. I don't have time to believe nothing. I don't have time to believe the deception. I don't have time to believe people who tell me that I cannot do it. I don't have time for me to believe when my cells in my own body are trying to be an axis of evil to tell me that we're not feeling well. What do I do? I shake off the beast into the fire simply because Enoch told us that there is a place that is called nothing and it is consuming fire. Nothing belongs in the fire. I thought people who love the grace message would be excited when I said nothing belongs in the fire. <laughs> oh yes, praise the Lord. Let me explain it to you another way. The Bible says that in him all things consist. I'm sharing with you a vision that the Lord showed to me. I've seen portions of it before, but it came to me again very strongly today. And for those of you who hear by words, you will understand and appreciate this. I heard it. But then it was a picture. Do I need to explain that? Do you all get it? Yeah, okay, good. Because, let me explain that a little bit for somebody who needs to get it. The Bible says that God made man in his image and in his likeness. Moses Anderson says, man made the computer in his own image and in his likeness. All right? We were made in the image and in the likeness of God and God is the creator. So a lot of what we make, in particular the computer, was made in our own image and likeness. So the way we are spirit, soul, and body, the computer is electricity, memory, and hardware. Okay, your soul, your consciousness is software. Your body is hardware, but the power that runs it is spirit. You understand what I mean? And so, when you're trying to understand yourself, sometimes it's easier for you to kind of take a computer and break it down and then you start to understand better how you function, right? So let me give you one example and then I'm gonna give you two more. This first example is so that you can understand, you understand better the relationship between you and your computer and how much it is very much like you. Now let me say this, um, I'm a computer scientist and I'm also a computer engineer. So what I'm telling you has been made subject to several tests, but you're welcome to reason it out on your own and to test it as well. You understand what I mean? Because the only way the computer works is because it is made in our image and likeness. Because there is no other way for things to function. If there was, God would have done it. <laughs> People have tried. People have tried all kinds of things. Now, the most advanced computers that we have today, computers that can read your mind, Right When I say read your mind, someone is like, wait, but the Bible says that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yes, that is the heart of man from the standpoint of your subconscious mind. But your conscious thought to some degree can be read simply because you are a machine the way you function in your thoughts. If I tell you now, Shayla, do not think about a white elephant. I know exactly what's on your mind. A white elephant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I say, Tyler, don't think about the rain outside, then immediately I know what's on your mind. So one of the ways by which we have trained artificial intelligence to teach, the way we have trained artificial intelligence to read minds is to teach artificial intelligence to make suggestions. And I'm gonna have to be careful here because for me to explain this thing, um, there are two patents that now belong to the military that is based on what I'm describing to you because I wrote the algorithms, both of them. And the reason why I got success, I was successful at writing it, is because I understand that if I look at me, God's own masterpiece, I can reverse engineer myself to create machines. So I was able to write algorithms 
to function like me and then get there more quickly because I'm not experimenting, I am just copying. And it's okay to copy God. God wants you to copy Him. You understand what I mean? He wants us to emulate Him, right? But the people who are out there struggling, trying to reinvent stuff, they're struggling because they do not want to acknowledge God. And the Bible says that from the visible elements of this world, we have an understanding of the invisible attributes of God and of eternity. So the reason why I'm being careful is because I don't want to give too much away, but I'm going to tell you this much. I taught by writing words, computers, in particular sensors, how to create pictures with which they navigate themselves on networks. Because words can become pictures. Does it make sense? So when I'm speaking to you, it forms pictures in your mind. So the computers that we have created that are able to read minds, so to speak, are able to do so because they have the ability to suggest words to form pictures within you and then they can deduce where you're at based, some, based on some other parameters. Now, the reason why I'm telling you that is this. Every picture that is on your phone, Brother Matthew, every image that is on your phone, including pixels that are colorful or not, every single one of them exists as a word. Okay, let's go back to computer 101. A computer is a machine. What is the spirit of the computer? Electricity. What is the state of the spirit? The spirit has two states because the spirit is breath. And what are the two, what are the two states of the breath that is in your nostrils? In and out. Zeros and ones. Okay? So the way we can create electricity or spirit out of electricity, when electricity is just flowing, it is like wind. It doesn't power anything. It can power stuff, but just mechanically. But for it to power stuff with consciousness, it has to be able to breathe in. And out. The Bible says, and God breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. If your computer is going to have intelligence, it has to be able to breathe in and out, zeros and ones, right? So when you have, when you have four zeros, I mean four bits, you call them a byte. When you have four bytes, you call it a word. In computer engineering, the first thing we teach a machine, believe it or not, is a word. Because if the computer does not understand a word, it cannot create a thing. Because there is nothing made that was made without the word. <laughs> He's a computer scientist. He knows what I'm talking about. The first thing, the first thing that the computer creates is a word. Because once you can teach the computer the word, then the computer can start to, this is what year, the year 2023. So we have heard that officially, because we're in the season of fours, please, I want you to listen to me. How many people have heard about chat GPT? Right, chat GPT, is that what it's called? Yeah. So basically, if you haven't heard about it, is this new platform that was created by OpenAI. Now, I don't like to say the word OpenAI because the word OpenAI is an instruction that, the, that is being sold to us believers who have authority. Because every time you're saying OpenAI, you are commanding for the portal to open for I to come back. Remember that the Lord told us a couple of years ago, that the enemy that we're fighting is I. The same enemy that Joshua had to fight, AI. That's the reason why they use the acronym AI. Because AI is I. That was the same enemy. And what does it mean? It means a pile of ruins. That's what AI means. And that is the reason why when the guy who created Chat GPT was first of all introducing, which is Elon, when he was introducing artificial intelligence, the very first campaign that he went on for months, he went all over the world telling people about AI, what was the word that he used to describe AI? 
destruction. He said, we need to be afraid of AI. He said, we should not touch AI with a long pole. While he was saying that, he was sitting on some of the most advanced accomplishments in artificial intelligence, but he was telling us not to touch it with a long pole. Do you remember that? He went around TV stations, magazines, podcasts, spending millions and millions of dollars to tell us not to worry about it because he said it is nothing but destruction. And I, when he was saying that, the Holy Spirit was saying to me, you know what he's saying because I already told you because AI means destruction, a pile of ruins. Elon kept telling us that AI will destroy everything. Oh yeah, he said it would, de it would destroy everything because it will attain its own consciousness and form an army. And what was the army that Joshua had to overcome? It was I, AI. And we are fighting the same enemy. And they're asking us to keep declaring that we're opening the portal for I to come back from the past. So now let me tell you the reason why this year 2023 is significant. How were we empowered by grace? What is the number of grace? Five. Stay with me. The current chat GPT that is out there can prepare a sermon. Joshua said to me about a month ago, sometime last year, maybe two months ago, thereabouts. It was just before Christmas. Yeah, so about a month ago. He said to me, he says that, he said, I want to show you what chat GPT can do. I have the text message, I can put it in the group or you can even try it on your own. And he held his phone in front of me and he said to me, he says, prepare a sermon from Genesis chapter one. And within about 33 seconds, this chat GPT prepared a sermon that almost made me cry. Because he speaks about the sovereignty of God. Joshua, you texted it to me, right? Okay, text it, text it to me if you still have a record of it. I want to read to you what this sermon is. If I can find it here, if, if, and if I don't find it, I won't take your time, but it might just be one of those things that is so easy to find. Oh, there it is. It was Wednesday, December 21st at 12.36 a.m. So Joshua is also becoming a night owl. Praise the Lord. Kind begets kind. He used to go to bed like at 8 o'clock just like his mom. And I'm like, whose son are you? If you are my son, then you have to be ready to, to be a night watch man. To be a Nazarene. You know what? That's what it means to be a Nazarene. To be one that watches the night. <laughs> you see, the Bible says, and that was the reason why you won $100 at Christmas game. Because the Bible says that Jesus would have been raised somewhere else, but he had to be led to Nazareth so that he can be called a Nazarene. The day that that thing hit me, it broke me before the Lord in humility. I said, Lord Jesus had to be raised in Nazareth so that he can be called a Nazarene. Because imagine what happened. If Jesus was not a Nazarene, we would have been lost and dead in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because humanity could not survive the tension that was in the Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples, their eyes could not stay open. They fell asleep. The only person that stayed up in the Garden of, e of Gethsemane at night to pray without slumber was the one that was called a Nazarene because in his blood he could not sleep when there is a watch to make and that was the reason why he said to them come and watch with me a little but there were no Nazarenes that sleep was not an ordinary sleep it was the sleep of death because death was was circling Jesus thinking is this really going to happen am I going to take the son of God but he was a Nazarene. He had already been called a Nazarene since he was a little child. It has been spoken over him. It, it had gone from prophecy to becoming destiny. That is the reason why you need to be careful what you speak over yourself. I was talking to Brother Matthew earlier and he was like, we are intercessors. I'm like, say that again. Because that is, we need to keep saying it. You wonder why you can't pray at night because you keep telling people that, oh, I can't pray at night. I love sleep so much. And then you will not. Because that is nothing. The word of God says that you are as Jesus is. So if he was a Nazarene, there's nothing stopping you from praying at night. 
And the Bible says, give not sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. If you haven't started praying at night, some of you, I know you love sleep, sleep early and then wake up early. I tell you, you know I tease my wife all the time that she goes to bed at 8 o'clock. Sometimes she even goes to bed at 7.30. But by the time it's midnight, by the time it's midnight, Okundara sum teledu kum geredi. Everywhere begins to shake. By the grace of God, our next house will be built completely out of stone and concrete. Because of what I have experienced in the hand of an intercessor. You know, some people pray and they can be in their bed. My wife, you will hear it as she's praying. Everywhere shakes. Look at what open, look at what chat GPT said. He said this, Genesis chapter 1 is the first chapter. Have I read this to y'all before? Okay, Genesis chapter 1 is the first, hold on one second. Let's not pretend like we are what we are not. Yeah. <laughs> the Bible says, let no man think of himself more highly than he ought to. Genesis chapter 1 is the first chapter of the book of Genesis and it's the first chapter of the Bible as well. In this chapter, we see the creation of the world and all that is in it. One of the key themes in Genesis chapter 1 is the idea of God's sovereignty and power. From the very beginning, God is shown as the creator and sustainer of all things. He speaks the world into existence and brings order out of chaos. This thing was written in about 30 seconds. The man spoke, he says, prepare me a sermon in five paragraphs. What I'm reading to you is paragraph two and it goes on and on and on. But let me read to you the last paragraph. Everything when you examine it theologically is sound. Now there's a reason why. The next version that comes out, I'm not going to read to you what it says. I'm reading this one to you because of the fact that this is the meat before the corruption. Because you can't create corruption and expect it to live. You need to start with something that is functional. You understand what I mean? And so this is, this is what they need to start with. So I can still read this to you. But the next one that is coming out, I'm not going to read to you what it says because then it's now going to be in the language of rebellion. So this is the substance before the corruption. So look at what the last paragraph says. And that is the reason why theologically is still sound so that we can believe in it because we were made to believe the truth. And without faith, yeah, they want to grab our attention. But look at the last paragraph. It says in conclusion, Genesis chapter one is a powerful reminder of God's sovereignty, goodness, and the special place that he has given to humans in his creation. It is a reminder that we are called to live in a way that honors and glorifies God and to be stewards of his creation. So let us seek to live in a way that is pleasing to God and may we always remember the greatness of his power and goodness. Now, how many people do you know who are Bible scholars who can prepare such a sermon in 30 seconds? Now, let me now tell you the reason why I read all of that to you because I want you to see the power of words. Right now, this thing boasts of only about 193 million words and word structures. Stay with me. What question did I ask you earlier about how we are empowered? By grace. And grace is the number of, five is the number of grace. This thing is being multiplied 500 times to be released any moment from now. It's going to boast of over a trillion word structures. Now, let me say this because I want you to know very clearly what is about to happen. This is version three. Version three of the code produced this. I'm gonna share with you something that I don't think I've shared with you before. I started out my career as a programmer. In the year 1998, thereabouts, 
I woke up one day and I said, I'm going to develop a system that is as close to me as possible. Now, I'm talking about in the 90s, my computer was an 8088 XT machine with 10 megahertz processor, 21 megabits hard drive, and no RAM. I was operating on 640 kilobytes of base memory. I'm talking about a very basic computer. The only programming language that I can run on it, technically, was basic, but I figured out a way to do batch programming on it. Story for another day. So with something as basic as that in a small village in Nigeria, I started to create a software. And you know what I called it? I called it Boxy. I said, because this is me in the box. And I started to develop this to be able to interact with people. So I got a test subject. I saw one of my friends at school. I said, what are you doing? Do you want to come home with me? I want to show you something. And I said, okay, come. And the friend followed me. I said, sit here and respond to the questions coming from the computer. My friend was completely blown away because the computer was able to start to relate with her. She was a law student. And you know law students, they can talk. Almost every conversation that she wanted to hold with the computer was flowing like that. She was like, how could you have done this? How is this even possible? I said, are you enjoying it? Is it answering your questions? She said, yeah, every question. I said, good. What she did not understand was that I had trained the computer to be able to guide the conversation to only the answers that it has. But she held the conversation with the computer. When I saw that, it did something to my ego. It made me feel like this is it. I can do this stuff. And after she left, I was excited. I was like, finally, this is what I am going to do with my life. And I went to bed and the Lord appeared to me. And they said to me, no, you're not. (laughs) I said, no, no. I said, you don't understand. This is big. I can do so much with this. Boxy just had a human conversation. We call it high level language. It was speaking English, but as she was running the program and talking to it, I was seeing code. I was seeing zeros and ones in my head because I knew what I put in the computer. And I knew that there was endless possibilities that I could do with that boxing because I made it in my own image and after my own likeness. And I was like, I can duplicate me multiple times. But that wasn't my objective. My objective was to create as many of it as possible and have so many variations of me so that nobody can beat me. Whatever I wasn't good at, Boxy will be better at. But I was using words to teach that computer to think. Of course, the Lord stopped me in my tracks. And when he knew that I wasn't giving up that agenda, he appeared to me one more time on campus because I couldn't keep it to myself. I was going to my department, the engineering department, and I was determined to boast to somebody. And he appeared to me and he stopped me and he says, no, don't stop here, keep moving. He said, because there are people here who must not know that you exist. Because in reality, what happened was, one of the guys who was closest to me, I didn't even tell him about Boxy, but I told him about some other things and he shared his own little secrets with me. A couple of months after that, the federal government came and they took him to go work on some special projects. And I haven't heard from him pretty much since around that time. But we know that he's still doing his secret, whatever, whatever that he's doing. So God wanted to shield me because that is not what he has for me. He has an assignment for me that may not even be in time. It may be in the millennia, but there is no hurry because we're not going anywhere. You understand what I mean? So I'm not in a hurry, but I tell you all of that to tell you this, that in 2023, in the season of fours, version four of chat GPT will be released with over a trillion words. And at that particular point in time, we're going to go beyond reading the minds of men to enslaving the minds of men. Because number four is the number of kings. And it wants to rule. And the Bible already warned us that when the Antichrist comes, it will make for itself a beast in its own image. And that beast will have a voice to speak. Are you still wondering who the beast is? What the beast is? Who the Antichrist is? 
or what the image of the beast is. Look no further. We have already seen it. But let me tell you something. What I've described to you, as scientific, as mathematical as it is, you don't require all of that to know God. No, you don't. Apostle Paul had an equivalent of a PhD at law and he had studied under a professor emeritus at Roman law and possibly Greek philosophy. A man by the name of, what's his name again? Gamaliel. These boys were brutal. They knew their stuff. And when he came into Christ, you know what he realized? He was like, all of what I thought I knew is, is done. It's nothing. He says, it's not even required here. He says, I've been called to be a preacher of the gospel. And this gospel is preached as though by foolishness. Isn't that what he said? That was why he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto righteousness, unto salvation. So I tell you all of these things to let you know that it could have been so impossible for us to know God if God had not come to reveal himself to us in simplicity. And what is the most simple thing? A word. Remember that all this nonsense that I told you about Boxy and how Boxy could hold conversations was because I understood the power of words and I taught it to my little computer and it started speaking in tongues. So I tell you what, God has given us his word. And that was why many people missed Jesus when he came. They were expecting a guy that would ride on a unicorn. A horse that had wings like Pegasus and a horn in front of it. People were expecting something complex and flamboyant. But he came wearing sandals and a robe. And when they said to him after a while, okay, we've seen the miracles. You probably are related to God somehow. We cannot tell. But they were like, okay, his own disciples who had followed him for years. Philip in particular. You know the interesting thing about Philip? I told you before. The word Philip means a lover of horses. What do horses represent? Speed. Philip was a fast thinker. If you look at all of his interactions with Jesus, he was thinking ahead of everybody. When Jesus says Lazarus was dead, he was like, let us go and die with him. He wasn't wrong. He was just too quick. Ah, shikum dari. So when God needed the scripture to go to Africa, the gospel, he had to send Philip because he needed somebody who could get there fast enough. Anyway, story for another day. But here is the deal about Philip. Philip asked Jesus, he was like, why don't you show us the father? Jesus says, you're looking at him. And they couldn't understand that the father of creation, the God of the heavens, who made all things, will be standing there in sandals. And God is like, yeah, I can do that. Because I love you so much. I want to make it easy for you to know me. Because if you do not know me, and if you do not know my word, there is no way you can function because you can never get anything done for there was nothing that was made that was made without the word. So all of that lecture, all of that philosophy, all of that mathematics is once again to remind you that God wants you to know him and he has made it so easy. He has given you his word. But the difference between version three of the chat GPT that can write essays better than pretty much anybody in this room, all of us, there's none of us that can write essays like chat GPT. Any problem that you want to solve, just tell it. Do you know that I saw somebody asking this thing to do things like this month, I'm a, fa I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, what did he call himself? He called himself some kind of influencer, a social media influencer. He says, and I want you to create for me 10 subject areas for my videos and describe how I will make the videos with five options each. And that thing put it forth in all of it in less than two minutes. And I read some of those things and I'm like, my goodness. It gave an idea of how you as a motivational speaker can present your topics, the topics that are relevant based on what people want to hear. Remember the Bible says they would develop itching ears and all of that stuff. He created it. But the difference between that 
which is able to get things done and read minds and the one that wants to be king upon the earth is the number of words that it has. The difference between this version of you and the version of you that will reign with Christ is how much of the word of God that you have. You see what I mean? The reason why the written word is powerful is because if you would just load yourself with the written word, you are unstoppable. There are no limits that can be placed on you. The reason why artificial intelligence appears to be unlimited or limitless is because there are no definite structures inside of it, just words. And a consciousness, of course, to be able to manipulate the words. So why can't you and I just keep loading ourselves up with the word of God? I'm going to keep singing this song until I see Christ formed in you, the hope of glory. Let us lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily beset us. And let us bury our faces in the word of God that we may not be buried in the ground. Let me tell you something. It is that way or the ground. The Bible says the ones who are not found in him will be done away with and the ground will open up and swallow them. I don't want to be buried in the ground. So I'm going to bury myself in the word of God because whatsoever is in the word of God. Jesus, in response to Philip, what did he say when he got to the tomb of Lazarus? In John eleven twenty five, 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. If any man be in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So if I am buried in the word of God, though I am dead, Guess what? I will live and the life that I will live is the glorified life. The word glorified life means eternal life. A life without limit. Not in longevity, not in quality, not in intensity, not in authority. It is without limit all around. And what does that for me? The word. Look at how much privilege we have and we don't even recognize it. We need to study the word. We need to get the word of God on the inside of us because Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So if you want to do exploits, if you want to know God, if you want to reign with him, if you want to reign and rule with him in the millennia when that time comes, if you want to be found in him all the time, you need his word. You need to know him. We're going to break bread. And I am going to read to us once again. Oh, I didn't even read it earlier on. Psalms 83 verse 7. Actually, um, 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 not verse 7. Psalms 83 verse 3. I said verse 3 already, right? Okay. Um, 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 um. I don't want to preach another sermon, but I want you to guys, I want you guys to get this thing. So let me let me just let me introduce this to you as we break bread. We're gonna use this as our breaking bread scripture. And I believe by the grace of God, as you open your heart to the power of the blood of the Lamb and the body that was broken, your minds will be open to be able to receive this thing that I may speak to you plainly as I have received this mystery of empowerment, this fire and this spark that ignites, this life that is the light of men. In the mighty name of Jesus. So Psalms 83 verse 3. This is what it says. It says they have taken crafty counsel against your people. And they have consulted together against your hidden ones. The New King James Bible says the sheltered ones. The King James Bible says the hidden ones. We are God's hidden ones. Lord help me. I have the go ahead to be able to release this over you. Let me tell you something. What did I tell you, Alan? Alan, God's been moving Alan in certain realms. That's so what I told him. But last week, I wanted to tell him plainly. But I'm like, man, I don't want to scare this man. Because what he was seeing, I knew. But I'm like, if I tell him the way it is, I don't want him to think that, okay, now this is getting into the territory of spooky. So I kept my peace. And then the angels of the Lord appeared to him. And then they started to break it down to him and give him an assignment. And I told him, what did I tell you, Alan? I said, they, have, they told you in subtle, subtlety, know thyself. I say that again to you as a witness. 
of the ones that are risen from the dead know thyself the reason why you're looking for your purpose you're looking for yourself is because you're looking in all of the wrong places the Lord God Almighty calls you is hidden ones where has he hidden you he has hidden you in his word because our lives are hid in Christ you want to know who you are look in the word Emmanuel you are in the word look in the word and you will begin to see yourself let me tell you what's going to happen to you when you start looking in the word before you see yourself like, I want you to listen please I'm going to ask you a question I want you to be very very honest even though when you were born and you were growing up there were mirrors in your house do you think you saw yourself before you saw others around you as children we see the people around us our mothers and fathers and we start to appreciate and recognize who they are before we recognize who we are when you start studying the word of god before you meet Shayla in the word you will meet David you will meet Abraham you will meet Jesus the sequence is such that you need to keep meeting people who are made in the image and in the likeness of God in different expressions to help you create for yourself the interpretation of self so that eventually one day you will just say now that is me so I want to encourage you if you notice that the Lord is leading you to study a person in particular in scripture don't say no 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 I don't want to study David I'm looking for Kenyatta no whoever the Lord is leading you they hold the key to unraveling who you are because they are the older ones in the family you know them before you know you I'm, I'm sharing with you things that I, the Lord himself schooled me in when I started studying scriptures and I've told you before the very first people that I met in scripture I saw Adam but I couldn't relate with him he was too far in the past I kept looking at him in the face he was literally like a red man I was looking at him in the face but I just couldn't make it much out of it he seemed like he was another kind of race or being he, was, he didn't even look like me and what I mean by he didn't look like me is even though if he wore the same thing that I'm wearing, it could be me, but then at the same time, something was very remotely distant about him. And the Lord knew where I was. I was like, okay, you don't get it. Next. And then they brought me Abraham. That one didn't even last. I was like, swipe. You see what I mean? You know, when Facebook is saying people you may know, swipe, I don't know this one. Oh, I used to know this one, but I know them no more because they denied me before people, so I'm denying them before my heavenly father. Swipe. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying but when I saw David it caught my interest it tickled my fancy I saw David and he was walking away but I just couldn't let him go I had to follow him I followed him through the path in the backside of the desert. I followed him through the chores that he had to do. I followed him and when I got to the cave of Adullam it broke me I was almost begging for them to leave me there because I'm like, what else? What else is there? But the Lord took me through that journey and when I emerged, I was able to bid them farewell because I saw my own path and I'm like, thank you. So I want to encourage you, let the word of God come to life. You see the things that I'm speaking to you, they're very calculated by the Holy Spirit. I'm speaking to you codes for understanding. It sounds like parables, but in reality, these are injected codes into your system wherein the Lord will enable for you to take flight within a short period of time. You will grow. You'll be deep in your understanding. I mean, have you seen how people have grown in this communion house? There are some people, when I hear them teach now, you know, sometimes I would listen to your messages. My wife was like, come and listen to Josephine. And I'm like, wow, Josephine. <laughs> Josephine. But I'm telling you, what a prophetic name. Because the name Josephine means the Lord will add. And the Lord has indeed added to her, Jehoseph. The Lord has added. Praise the Lord. And I say to you, that the Lord has added to you. 
And then the Lord will also add you to another. You wait and see. Go and write down the number 52. When it happens, I will tell you what it means. God is good. He has done me well, oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, you have given gifts unto the sons of men that together we may all be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Let all the glory, honor be to you. Father, thank you for the privilege of being your hidden ones, even though sometimes we don't like to be hidden. Sometimes we complain. Sometimes we want to be in the light. Sometimes we want to be known. Sometimes we want to be seen. But Father, may we continue to find the grace and the humility. In the, may we continue to find the humility in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to learn how to hide ourselves in these vessels of clay until we are transfigured. Up until then, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, may we stay humble, may we stay silent, may we, may we stay attentive to your word. Glorify yourself in the Son. And continue to aid the Son by your Holy Spirit to glorify you in obedience. Let there be light. May we see your light, O oh God. And may we follow your star. May we follow your star that we have seen, Lord. May we hear the voice of your angels telling us not to return to Herod. May we find you where you were wrapped. May we worship you, O oh God. May we find you. And may we give to you the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Father, your light is upon us. May we follow your light. That we might see who we are in you. And that we might worship your very glory. The glory of your only begotten Son. <laughs> Aye, medorie, sangalaria, Baburo kudushte ala madeli la baho sayala, Hum mumuyale muzui mama, Hum gare lodie. The Holy Spirit of God. Is here. Is the bringer of life. Let him lift you. Come and fellowship with him. Come and sit at his feet. It is time for you to become the word. To be transformed into that same image from one level of glory to another level of glory. Oh, Elahi, oh, my Amaha o my eye is he and be a meno higher than my horse ya zia bahamgo is o my eye a meno boze boze aramade boze boze aramade boze yamakosho to the kilamane di elama thank you jesus let us eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. And eyes are about to be open in here today. Ah. Water return into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. 
he has given us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The dead in Christ shall rise first. There is the power to fall in love with him. There is the power to love him who first loved us because he first loved us. I hear that the power to fall in love with the word of God is being handed out tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we worship you. We give you praise because if you are for us, no one can be against us. And you are for us and you are with us and we will never stumble. God bless you guys. Alan. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Thank you, sir. All righty, we're going to prepare for offering as we uh, just give God thanks for this word that has come forth. If uh, my brother Charles could help us with the uh, offering slide there. Thank you, sir. Father, we give you praise. We thank you, oh God. You'll see in just a few moments the giving details there. Let's give in faith. Let's give in thanksgiving for what the Lord has done here as he's freely given out to us these goodies, these blessings, his presence. If you need an envelope, we have the uh, envelopes here on the left-hand side. Um, and if you're here and you still haven't filled out a Connect card, please go ahead and do that, and uh, we can get locked in with you. We'll just wait a couple more seconds, and we'll prepare our tithes and offerings, and we'll lift that up, and we'll go from there. Father, we give you praise for how you've met with us tonight. Lord God, let us carry this home to our children, to our loved ones, oh God, how we've seen and experienced you tonight. Lord, we thank you for how you bless us this season, that this is our season, oh God, of going forth, knowing that your glory has risen upon us, oh God, that we shall arise and shine. Lord God, we thank you for the testimonies, oh God, of how you have showed up in our lives, oh God, how those things that we have been waiting on you for are being made manifest this season, oh God. And so, Lord, we give to you in thanks. We give to you in praise and let it be pleasing in your sight. All glory and honor belong to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So y'all know we'll be right back here Saturday. And don't forget, today's Tuesday, Wednesday, tomorrow, we'll be online praying, 9 p.m. on Instagram. Please join us. The Lord has really just been dealing with us mightily there. And uh, we look forward to that. So everyone have a blessed night. Y'all be safe on the road. And we'll see y'all Saturday.